Nicaragua is a good place to be. I, I know the United States is obsessed with getting rid of the Sandinista government, and they poured in hundreds of millions of dollars since 2010, hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars to get rid of the Sandinista party and Daniel Ortega. And they're, in an election year, they're really, really spending a lot of energy uh, with, the, with the media and who knows behind the scenes. Uh, they consider that this is one of their, maybe their biggest opportunities to get rid of uh, the Sandinista party. And I think um, I want to be here with the people exactly. and support the people here no matter what happens. I mean, the people support, for the most part, the Sandinistas because the Sandinistas have supported the people. Uh, but I'm, I'm just, I just want to be with, with the Nicaraguan people, whatever happens. Um, even if, even if I get shot or die, I mean, I'm going to, well, we're all going to die at some point, and I'm happy to die in Nicaragua. You know, I, I went on a fast in 1986 on the Capitol Steps with three other veterans. I was 47 days on water only. Uh, that was, that had got some publicity. Uh, there was four of us, three vet Vietnam veterans and one World War II veteran, and we were just so upset about what the U.S. was doing, we decided to do something that was different. Like we're going to sit here. We're not going to. We're not going to bother anybody. Overtly, we're just going to sit here and starve. Mm -hmm. And um, that ended after 47 days because one of us was near death, and we had originally decided that all of us would die. But when the first person of the four of us started getting really ill, we had to rethink everything. Mm -hmm. And we ended the fast after 47 days. <clears throat> and then <clears throat> that, because the Sandinistas were in power in Nicaragua, and this was a fast to stop Reagan's policy in Nicaragua and Salvador, uh, we were in the Nicaragua news a lot, uh, especially with the Sandinistas had their own paper, the Barracada, at the time. And then a year later, um, uh, well, then for many months after the fast, I, I spent a lot of time in the war zones again in Nicaragua. And I, was, I did a walk with 10 other vets from Hinotega to Wiwili, it was 75 miles. Uh, we just walked for a week. Uh, we had to learn how to look for mines. We had, a, we had an instruction on how to look for the fresh mines, and there was the most mined road in Nicaragua. Um, and the cultures were, were, would get on the radio station and say that we, they were going to kill us. And we said, well, we're going to keep walking. You can do whatever you want, but we're going to keep walking. Mm -hmm. so it was kind of tense. Uh, but that, that was actively in the news in Nicaragua. I don't know. It wasn't that much in the U.S., of course. Mm -hmm. And then a few months later, uh, some of us decided to go to the weapons depot in California where the weapons are coming from to El Salvador and Nicaragua against the Salvadoran people and the, and the Nicaraguan people. I mean, the weapons are coming to the Contras and in Salvador, the death squad government. And <clears throat> that's where the weapons are shipped. And they are shipped by virtue of a three-mile train from the bunkers to the ships on the, in the Sacramento River, and then they come to Central America by, by sea. So when we were blocking the movement of the munitions, um, I mean, I'm a, I was an installation security officer in the military for four years. Uh, I, I knew how, how the military works and how they guard installations and how they, how they have all kinds of regulations to preserve safety, at least for the U.S. soldiers. Right. Um, and so I wasn't worried that we, when we blocked the train we were going to get run over. I, I expected to do a year in prison, which was a, which was the explicit penalty for blocking the, the weapons train, $5,000 fine and a year in prison. So I was expecting to do a year in prison uh, when, we start, when I started the blockade. And then the very first day of the of the blockade of the trains, 
which was September 1st, 87, uh, the train never stopped. And in fact, the train, the train accelerated. Uh, the speed limit was five miles an hour, and the FBI saw the, examined the video footage. We had one video, uh, one video um, was there, and they said the train was going at 17 miles an hour at the time, and I didn't get out of the way in time, so I lost my legs, lost my half of my brain. I got a big plate here. I lost my right frontal lobe. Uh, I, the upper half of my face is plastic surgery corrected from here up. Uh, this ear was sewn back on. Um, my shoulders were broken. My elbows were broken. Most of my right ribs were cracked. Um, I lost both legs, but I, here I am. Um, I'm still alive, uh, still, still kicking. That was in, that was in 1987, so it was 34 years ago. So, um, 1987. Yeah, so they thought they were going to kill me. And when I was in the hospital for a month, uh, the first few days I wasn't sure, I wasn't clear that I was going to survive, mostly because of the brain injury. Um, they had to steam clean my brain because so much grease got in my my open skull under the locomotive uh, before they could operate. I, I wasn't aware of this. I was mm -hmm. told this later. But um, the doctors told me when I was more lucid in the, in the hospital after five or six days, they said that I had a lot of revolutionary energy it was a the word they, <laughs> they used. They said, you will... You were raising your fist, revolution, revolution. I don't remember it at all. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I, you know, I just, I saw so much criminality in Vietnam that I was part of. I just, it just taught me mm -hmm. three PhDs about human behavior and history and lying and, and how being conditioned as a big white male is a really a, a terrible disability. You don't. You're not taught to think. You're not taught to critically review anything. But I, I got it. In Vietnam, I got it. Yeah. I got it. And I was 27 years old, so, which was older than most of the GIs. But I got it. I got it. At least it started me on a, a, a new life altogether, of realizing everything's connected. And I studied the history of the U.S. in detail. It was all a lie. Everything we were taught was lies, including George Washington and Thomas Jefferson. I mean, they were they were land speculators and slaveholders, and um, so I realized that the whole mythology of our history was bullshit, and it conditioned us to be obedient to this su superior civilization, which, to me, was. Um, Fraudulent, right. and so I, it it helped develop my more radical base of understanding the root of the problem, the cause of the problems, the history of the problems, the history of our language, the how we're taught to think and uh, not challenge assumptions. So it was actually for me it was a, it was an experience that actually t taught me. It taught me, uh, actually it was, it preempted and su superseded all my graduate education, which was, you know, I had a, a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, two law degrees, and it was like, what was that about? To a hospital in Cuba where they were treating um, the uh, FMLN combatants that had been seriously injured. There was 300 of them there. And I'd been with us, I'd been, I'd visited the guerrillas in Chalantanango. Uh, I had to go by horse. I had these legs, so I couldn't walk up the, the, mm. the hill. So I had a horse and I was with three others and we went and spent three days with the guerrillas. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they actually brought music in at night. We and had, when was that, what year was that? 
1988. Um, we danced all night. Uh, they, they knew they were safe at night in that location. Um, but we were celebrating solidarity and um, uh, one of the, one of the one of the the um, leaders of that group of FMLN was killed a year later in the offensive in uh, November December of eighty nine. Mm -hmm. um, but we had got we had gotten to Chalantenango by hiring a driver from San Salvador to go at night up the highway to to Chalantenango. Chalantenango. Chalantenango? Is that how you pronounce it? Chalantenango? Yeah. Um, and we went through 12, 12 roadblocks and everybody, all the Salvadoran soldiers were asleep. So we creeped over the road bump. We creeped over the road bumps mm -hmm. to make as little noise as possible. We had a story if we got caught and we weren't going to be on our way to uh, uh, a city in Honduras. Um, so when we got to Chalantenango and we visited the, the military headquarters there, and we were in civilian clothes, and we walked into we walked into the uh, military headquarters. There was a door next to pallets of AID, USAID bags of rice, I assume. And we opened the door. It was unlocked, and we walked in. Actually, there was five of us, and there were two U.S. advisors had a map talking about the latest FMLN attacks and which villages were going to get the, the rice if they had agreed to support the, the Salvadoran government against the, the guerrillas. Mm -hmm. And so we, they, thought, they thought, because nobody comes in that door, mm -hmm. as far as they were concerned, it was at the back of the building just off the street, and they thought we were CIA. Did you say to people? Yeah, the, the two, no, the two U.S. military advisors. So they started talking to us oh. about the latest battles on this big map they were looking at, and we were all veterans. And, and actually, we, one of us was ex-CIA. And um, so we spent 45 minutes talking to them about the war until one of the sergeant who was from Iowa, he said, I really need to call my boss in San Salvador, the U.S. military attache, Colonel Wheeler. So he went and called Colonel Wheeler, and then he came back and said, Colonel Wheeler said, we have to stop this conversation right now. And he wants us to see you immediately. We, and then he, we, we transmitted a message saying, we will see him when we get back to San Salvador. Uh, which we did in three days, we did see him. But he couldn't believe we had been up in the mountains with the guerrillas, walking into the military headquarters, talking to the advisors, <laughs> with nobody, nobody stopping us. Wow. And the guard outside of the military headquarters, which was Salvadoran, he just saluted us as we walked by. Because who would we be other than some kind of U.S. Uh, you know, agents? And we, we um, <laughs> so we saluted back. <laughs> and, um, and three of the five spoke Spanish, three of the five of us spoke Spanish. So that was an interesting time with the uh, FMLN. Um, they knew we were coming, so they, they were planning an event when we got there. Um, and they showed us the other villages that had been bombed the day before. and because we spent another day there. Um, and then when we went to Cuba, we, we visited the injured combatants that were missing arms and legs and uh -huh. eyes and faces. And uh, it was, they had a name for it. It was a whole, a whole wing of a hospital just devoted to FMLN soldiers. Some were as young as 16. So what were like the main lessons or things you saw in Vietnam? Well, cruelty, criminality, uh, not giving a shit about anything. The Vietnamese were gooks and vermin 
and I, I, I realized that the U.S. was, was uh, well, I was just starting to learn about U.S. history, and um, I realized that um, if you're white, really you don't care about other people. And if the government tells you that you should go and kill the commies, you do it. And the commies happen to be non-white. Um, and we lied constantly. We would bomb villages and count all the people dead as enemy, what we call BC. But because I w visited five of those villages after the bombings, I knew that almost everybody killed was a small child. So uh, we, were, we were bombing villages to get body counts. That's all it mattered politically. Body counts, body counts, body counts. And so that's what really made me furious, is that we didn't give a shit about these people. They're, they're really not very inquisitive. And I was one of them. Uh, and I thought, wow, all these things are happening and people in the United States don't know anything. But I happened to be there. And I was, uh, I began to be a witness to what I considered um, war crimes every day. And we lied about it. And because we're an exceptional people. That's that's the, um, that's the sickness we grew up with in the United States. We're an exceptional. White people are exceptional. And you don't have to think about anything too seriously because you're not, you're a, an American. I, I realized in Vietnam that I was the enemy, um, that I was like an ideological robot. And that's not what I came in the world to be, an ideological robot. And I started questioning the war. I, started, I was a lieutenant. I started questioning my superiors. Uh, I wasn't very courageous or bold about it, but I was talking about it. Um, I said, this war is unconscionable. It's a violation of the United Nations Charter. It's a violation of the U.S. Constitution and the wars of the uh, the rules of combat, the rules of warfare that we learned in school, in, in military school, you do not shoot at civilian targets. That's all we did. That's what we did every day. Mm -hmm. uh, because we called them enemy. Everybody was the enemy. Right. So it's just a big lie. The whole, the whole culture is a big lie. And we had, then we had the golden age of capitalism after World War II to about the mid-70s, so everybody that was formidably trained and educated in those 30 years knew that capitalism was the greatest thing in the history of the world. And then we, we all were docu and, uh, indoctrinated with the Cold War, uh, with the Cold War propaganda, and we were we were in euphoria because we defeated the Nazis, which we did not do. It was the Russians that defeated the Nazis. So we got, this is the period I grew up in. And then there's the whole America's the greatest. And, and they don't even say the U.S. America is the greatest. America's the greatest. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's not the greatest. It's, it's the sickest. It's the cruelest. Um, it's sadistic. Um, and it goes right back to our origins. Massacres of the indigenous, enslavement of human beings. That's how we got our prosperous beginning, by stealing land forcefully from the Indians and stealing labor forcefully from the Africans. That's, that gave us a 200 year head start on prosperity. It was all free, based on exploiting land and people and killing people. Nobody really pays much attention to that history. That history cast the DNA of our culture.